Let's, uh, let's go ahead and kick things off. I'm uh, Scott McCaffrey. Welcome everybody to Stethoscope. This is the Hawaii Medical Association's show news hour and uh, boy are there a lot of issues going on. Uh, what we're going to tackle today is uh, physician payment options and some of these new scenarios that doctors are getting paid through. Uh, I, call, I, I put a tagline on that, the good, the bad, and the ugly because some of them are, are promising and others are quite frightening uh, with respect to the motivations that are built in for doctors' care. Uh, some are actually antithetic to our Hippocratic Oath as physicians in always putting the patient first versus a pocketbook of ourselves or possibly the employer we work for. So uh, there's, some, there's a big thing going on in healthcare right now and if we come together as a community and with all the stakeholders, we can actually put together a unique approach as Hawaii has been known for over the years, unique approaches and cutting edge approaches to healthcare, that we have an opportunity here to, to forge something really unique and effective. Uh, I want to welcome to the show here Dr. Stephen Kimball. Uh, Dr. Kimball is past uh, president of the Hawaiian Medical Association two years ago. He is a, uh, and is currently serving as the chair of the committee at Hawaii Medical Association that's taking a look at uh, new healthcare policy and, uh, some, and whether or not we can apply some innovative uh, solutions to what's going on. Uh, Dr. Kimball, welcome to Stethoscope. Thank you. A, a little bit about your background, where are you from originally? Um, I was born in Boston, grew up in Hawaii from the age of nine. I did the first two years of medical school here and then finished at Harvard. I trained in both internal medicine and psychiatry, and I practiced in Boston for about six years before moving back here in 1985, and I've been in practice of psychiatry ever since then, and I've also been working in Queen Emma Clinic for the Department of Medicine, helping to train primary care internists on how to deal with psychiatric issues in primary care. Excellent. You also served on the governor's bo board and some other authoritative bodies that were taking a look at, at ways to help our healthcare delivery system here. Is that correct? Well, the legislature passed a bill a few years back to create the Hawaii <coughs> Health Authority, which was supposed to set overall health policy for the state. And uh, this was during the Lingle administration, and she vetoed it, and the legislature overrode her veto, but she refused to appoint anyone to the board. And when Abercrombie came in, he did appoint the Hawaii Health Authority, including myself. But then the Affordable Care Act passed at the same time and he pivoted to implement that and basically pushed the Hawaii Health Authority aside and ignored everything we said. But uh, there, there may be some hope that it could be reactivated now under the EGA administration. And that's one reason we're having this show is to talk about that and as well as some other uh, current events and, and new developments here. Uh, I'm also very uh, proud to have with us today a, another physician who has also served as one of our lead legislators for uh, uh, since actually 2004. He was, was served in the House of Representatives here in Hawaii and uh, for four years and then later became a, a senator in 2008 and continues to serve with distinction in that role. In addition, and I, I, I think uh, sometimes I call him Rambo because he's in addition to all that and being a father uh, with a family, uh, he has also held down a full-time emergency medicine position on the big line on the, excuse me, on the Big Island, uh, delivering care to the people over there yeah, at a hospital uh, uh, on the Big Island. And I just uh, don't know how he does it. Uh, Dr. Dr. Senator Green, welcome. How the heck do you do it? I just skip sleep periodically. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's my pleasure to be in a conversation with three good friends and people who I think are the top thinkers in healthcare in the state. Uh, I came to Hawaii uh, later, of course, than Steve, uh, Stephen did. I came to Hawaii in 2000 with the National Health Corps uh, to repay my loans, and I, that was my introduction to Hawaii to work in Kau as a family doctor for a couple years, for four years, at which time I also began to do ER work like you described and got into the legislature. So it's been a really uh, great experience, wonderful people, you know, I've met as patients and as colleagues like you guys, and have really experienced this almost like getting a PhD in health policy by being a chair or vice chair or kind of fly on the wall sometimes seeing the full scope of possibility in healthcare and healthcare policy some of which we've done okay on and some we've probably missed opportunities. Well welcome, uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, over on my left here we have Chris Flanders, Executive Director of Hawaii Medical Association, a background as a neuropathologist but uh, also served as the 
Executive Director for the Texas uh, Medical Association. Uh, he has been with us here at Hawaii Medical Association now for what, Chris, about seven, six years? Six years. Now. Six years. Uh, and has uh, really made an impact on the legislature as well as uh, steering through the, the difficult sort of a minefield of what healthcare has become these days. Uh, welcome, Dr. Flanders. Yeah, thanks for having me. And how about just a little more about your background, since I probably flubbed it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a Texan by, uh, by uh, training and, and by practice. Practiced my career in, in San Antonio and came here with my wife, who's a cardiologist, in uh, 2006. And we're, we're happy to be here. It's the best move we made career-wise is, is coming here. Uh, we're going to talk first today about some of these new uh, doctor payment scenarios that are coming into the market here as well as on the mainland. And I want to turn it over first to Steve Kimball. Steve, tell, us, tell me uh, what went into the process of studying uh, uh, what's going on here in reimbursement and kind of that process. And then we can get into the nuts and bolts of, of your findings as well as any recommendations you might have. Okay, well, um, physicians have traditionally be, been paid with fee for service, which means you, you know, provide a service to the patient, uh, whether it's uh, cognitive services, counseling, or, or a surgical procedure, and you get paid by the procedure. And um, Hawaii, under fee for service, uh, had, we've also had our prepaid health care act, which means that anyone working 20 hours a week or more is, has health insurance provided by their employer. And that's guaranteed broad coverage in the population and um, good risk pooling, which means the, the risk for those who have serious illnesses spread across a large population. And uh, with that system, paying doctors fee for service, we also have the highest percentage of small independent practices of any state, uh, mostly one and two doc practices. With that combination, we've had among the lowest health insurance premiums in the country, the lowest uh, per capita Medicare costs in the country, and a very cost-effective system. And uh, with the Affordable Care Act, uh, the rationale being provided is that fee-for-service is the problem. It's being blamed for driving the high cost of care, which ignores the Hawaii experience. And so the solution is to stop paying doctors fee-for-service and pay them by capitation, where you give them a fixed amount of money to cover a patient's care or a population of patients. And if they deliver too much care, they lose money. If they deliver less care, they make money. Uh, the problems with, with this, that, well, the idea is that that would mean doctors would have an incentive not to do unnecessary care, assuming there is a lot of unnecessary care, which has never been shown to be the case in Hawaii. In the I'd, like to, I'd like to go into that assumption yeah. because I, I hear that, that uh, some doctors are, are churning, uh, churning patients or just seeing them to, to see them and make money. There's kind of a, a subtext going on about that. But, uh, and, that, and that doctors are becoming too mercenary uh, or commercial, but uh, in the, the doctors I know and work with and refer to, I, I, don't, I don't see it. Uh, what, what's with that assumption? Is it, is it, are people on the mainland uh, actually creating, or doctors there creating these, or committing these sins that we are having to pay for here? Or what's your take on that? I think there are certain communities on the mainland where, where this has been a problem, where doctors start to view medical practice as a business with a purpose of making money and try to see how much they can churn uh, in terms of doing procedures. That has been a minimal problem in Hawaii. I'm sure there is unnecessary care, but it's usually not because doctors are deliberately trying to do unnecessary things. It's because maybe they um, are too busy to uh, make sure that people get the proper care so that the improper care happens or, or uh, you know, mistakes are made or things like that. So there are unnecessary things. There are opportunities for improvement. But it's not based on blatant greed the way it has been in certain communities on the mainland. But they're, they're relatively small pockets. You know, I think there's some of this has gone on in places like Miami and some of the big cities on the East Coast. But it has not been a problem in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the local Chamber of Commerce. And I actually, I've, I've been down there advocating on behalf of doctors as small business uh, men and women. Uh, of course, running a business, you do have to stay in business, and sometimes you have to do the double step to get enough, you know, just to see. Uh, but it seems like there's a, there has been a treadmill uh, from my standpoint historically, and I've been in healthcare for 35 years, but there's so much pressure to see patients quickly because our reimbursements here are so low. You actually, you have to run, I have to run harder than I would like to. I don't have enough time to spend with each patient like I would like to. 
but it's simply because you can't keep the lights on uh, here if you don't run hard. And you know, it's the mo one of the most expensive places on earth to set up a practice. So like what's with that? When I was in my early days of practice, reimbursements were, were uh, uh, enough or adequate enough that you actually had time during your day to read a journal or two. And those, it seems like that's just disappeared. And there's, we've, we've gotten into a world where there's so much cost pressure. And, and, and by the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, and you too, uh, Senator Green, but the doctors that I have polled, and I'm up to probably 25 or 30, various specialties, broad range from surgeons to primary care, but doctors here in Hawaii today are making 30% less than they were uh, a decade ago. Any comments on that? Maybe Dr. Green, you know something about it. Well, first, I, I would agree with Stephen. Um, churning here or seeing a lot of patients for money is really not a challenge or problem for us. I, I don't see that as the primary driver of cost. In Hawaii, we have such a severe shortage of providers in general that are fully in practice, available uh, as full-time equivalents, as we've said, FTEs we don't have a lot of extra time or a lot of extra care that's delivered, number one. So I think that that should be not considered one of our sins here in healthcare. Also, the big drivers of cost, to my understanding, and people should correct me, are really not so much in the d delivery of care by the physicians or their assistants or what have you, but the high cost of pharmaceuticals, the, uh, the cost of administrative, services, very high cost, and also the high cost of hospitalizations, which all these things have driven costs much more than primary care doctors or psychiatrists or, or um, people doing the surgeries. Those costs have not gone up. They've come down like you described. So the combination of our shortage where people are having a hard time finding a doctor that's got enough time to see them, particularly in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, which pay very, very little for time, uh, that combined with the fact that the costs are much higher elsewhere, I think that targeting physicians to make that the savings to save the healthcare system is probably the wrong approach. Uh, so when I see some of the things we're gonna talk about today, changing the payment model, I sometimes think that <clears throat> it's people, they're probably not bad, they don't have bad intentions, but it's just yet another attempt, people thinking up these ideas without Hawaii necessarily or a rural underserved state in mind. Uh, I think we could do a heck of a lot better if we could have a more sensible approach to the cost of pharmaceuticals, if we could uh, wrap our brains around how much it costs to hospitalize people. Because I know Chris will tell you, like on Big Island, we have very low cost per patient uh, per year for a couple of reasons. One, we have a lot of Medicaid patients, so the cost and pay is very low, as Stephen will tell you. And two, we don't have a lot of specialty services. We don't have, we don't have invasive cardiology. You can't get, if you're a, a patient on the Big Island, a fancy expensive test that's maybe very necessary, like a cardiac catheterization, which might cost many thousands of dollars. Life I mean, we should have these services. We should have these services, but right now we don't have them. You have to fly, of course, to Honolulu or Maui or wherever. So um, people are just trying to deliver direct care and to find enough hours in their day which contributes to all of these other problems, whether it's physician burnout or people retiring or they're moving to the mainland. So I would have always hoped that we could take up some of the solutions that we've proposed, which would be to decrease the pressure elsewhere, decrease either physician's loans or increase their reimbursements for the direct care of patients. Do those things and then do a better job keeping people out of those high cost settings. So that's kind of my thinking on the subject. Yeah, uh, Chris Flanders. Uh, what I, my st my reading is that doctors get paid about eighteen percent of the healthcare pie. Can you confirm that, or what's what's what do you yeah, what do you it's know? Roughly, it's roughly a, a in that ballpark. It depends on what source you look at for for that information as to how the data is collected. But it's it's relatively low. Um, the big portion of it is uh, goes to the hospitals, goes to the vendors where we buy our supplies, goes to the pharmaceutical companies, goes to the administration of the medical care system. And, and we forget that there's a whole other sector that really doesn't get a, uh, attention paid to it, and that's the regulatory sector. And more and more money is being spent from the healthcare dollar on the regulatory piece.
You're talking about like third party administrator uh, groups, uh, uh, local on the mainland or, right. or so forth. Uh, yeah, I, uh, what, what puzzles me is that the premiums to employers keep going up and up and up. Uh, the do doctors that, I, that I've polled, uh, their, their fees and income is going down and down and down. Mm -hmm. So what's up with that? Yeah. Where's all this money going? And I, uh, one, one thing that was brought up is the third party administrators that are chosen by some of our local carriers here, uh, HMSA being one of them, of course, uh, utilizing these uh, mainland groups as a, a way to, to try to govern down uh, health care costs here through making it difficult for doctors uh, to get yeah. some tests and some treatments. And, and that's not what this show's about. But, but uh, uh, and, we, and we actually have covered that in, in a previous uh, stethoscope uh, show, it was number two, I believe. For those of for those of you who are watching, you can you can tune in, and that's on HawaiiMD.tv, uh, which you're watching this on now. So check out episode two if you want to know more about that. But our focus here today is on some of these new doctor reimbursement scenarios. Uh, Steve, you want to run us through? I mean, you, you touched on them, but could we? You, and you did a real good job in your paper. Um, we've already covered the fact that we're we're kind of wondering whether or not doctors should be getting targeted so hard for trying to control the health care cost if we're only getting 18% of the health care pie. Uh, we've also just got done discussing that some of these other areas of health care and the cost control component of it, which continues to rise, including the third party and uh, uh, TPAs, third party administrators, uh, and other, uh, of course, you went, you went over in your paper a number of different uh, tools and mechanisms mechanisms that regulators and insurers utilize to try to reduce the cost of health care, but in the process make it difficult for doctors to practice as they were trained. Can you go over a few of those with us? Sure. I, I want to lead into this with a comment on what you were just discussing, which is I ran the numbers on my own gross practice receipts before overhead, and for the last 10 years they've been completely flat. My HMSA premiums have doubled in the same, more than doubled in the same period of time. And my overhead has been going up, so my net pay is going down. And th those are my personal numbers. So it's obviously not what they're paying psychiatrists that's driving the rise in HMSA's premiums, because those have been completely flat. It's, it's, the, it's, it's these things you mentioned, and yeah. just to riff with you a little bit, like there's a whole yeah. series of new industries also that are popping up. The, the middlemen in the space of management, which Steve's about to tell us about some of these companies, I mean, whole new industries popping up, obviously are taking some big part of the pie, but they're not delivering an extra moment of health care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you want to improve the, um, the, the lot of the physician trying to care for patients, you can raise their pay, but you can also reduce their overhead. And all of the reforms that are going on have been increasing the administrative burdens on doctors. It's estimated physicians spend about 20% of their time now on non-clinical tasks. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it has been progressively escalating every year in recent years by a substantial degree. Um, we, in this country, our administrative costs for physicians are three or four times what they are in other countries. Same thing for hospitals, three or four times. The cost of it, uh, administering um, health insurance or, or you know, the payment mechanism is far, far higher in the U.S. than any other country. Every insurance company, every hospital has multiple consultants and partners and business entities that they're contracting with, all of whom are siphoning money out of the healthcare system, just like you said, and they're not delivering any healthcare. Is it possible we're spending, nowadays we're spending more, <laughs> more trying to control the cost of health or control doctor behavior to, to uh, and or I guess uh, uh, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry behavior or, and other uh, areas that are, that are cost drivers in the health, that we're spending more trying to control it than we are saving? <laughs> you, you might very well be right. We're getting close to the 50-50 point with that. The, the thing is that the, the assumption in this country has been the reason health care costs so much in the U.S. is that we're delivering too much care. And as I have implied, that's a false assumption. But if you start with that assumption, then the solution is, oh, we need to ratchet in the care that's being provided. So we have all these efforts to manage care, all these efforts to get insurance companies involved in determining whether this or that thing that a doctor did was necessary or unnecessary and how to ra ratchet that in, making doctors get prior authorizations, restricting formularies, all these kind of things, which means that you as a doctor are bogged down, jumping through hurdles, trying to take care of your patients. 
And, and what about the what about the poor patient? I, I have patients uh, <laughs> because they have to get pre-authorization now for a wide variety of medicines. Uh, of course, the most uh, recent uh, difficulties we're having with HMSA on uh, pre-authorization of imaging, essential imaging, yeah. uh, you know, high-resolution CT, MRI, and so forth. I, I d the, my patients are suffering more. They have to, of course, the, the disappointment of not being able to uh, to tell them what's wrong with them when they come to you. Uh, a, a medication that my, you, you might think will really help them, and you got to run through hoops. I even got, I have had a prescription from my doctor the other day, and he gave me a card to cover the copay, and I was on the phone 45 minutes activating the card, and I, I must have, I, I bet I pressed like 45 buttons by the time they got done quizzing me to get the darn card activated to cover the copay. So what about the poor patients that are suffering here? I, 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 not enough of those stories are being told in my opinion. It used to be that uh, for the Medicaid program here, all generics were covered. And there are certain brand-only drugs where there were good generic alternatives where you had to get prior authorizations. But you knew if you prescribed a generic, it was going to go through. Now the uh, insurance companies are all contracting pharmacy out to pharmacy benefit managers who have started ratcheting down their formularies. Which and they're type of TPA, a pharmacy benefit? There's, what, what are the, there's, there's pharmacy benefit managers, there's imaging yeah, benefit but, uh, managers, yeah. there's... There's all these benefit. middlemen, yeah. But, but, <laughs> but non-benefit managers? Now it's, now it's <laughs> the case that a lot of the generics require prior authorization too. And in psychiatry, a lot of the drugs have a lot of side effects, and people have trouble tolerating them. And you usually go through a process of trying multiple different antidepressants or antipsychotics early on until you find something the patient can take and they can tolerate, and that works for them. Now you get uh, HMSA contracts pharmacy out to CVS, and they say, okay, your patient's on this generic drug that's been out forever. It's no longer on our preferred list. Tell us everything else they've tried and show us that they've tried and failed all the ones that are on our preferred list or we won't let you get fill that prescription. But that's in the medical record, isn't it? But I have to spend half an hour yeah. digging through a chart from 15 years ago to find out which drugs were tried and what happened when you tried each one. I don't want to have to do that. I already went through that. My patient doesn't benefit that one bit. But it's a burden on, on you and your time and time you could be spending with other patients. And this and kind of thing is now happening. Shorted, it just didn't make any yeah. sense. This kind of thing is now happening for about half my patient encounters, which is outrageous. Uh, so my idea is let's find a way to pay doctors that eliminates a lot of the administrative overhead and the inter interference in care. Let's doctors do what they're trained to do. Let them take care of patients. Let them respond to the patient's needs instead of having to worry about what the insurance company will say if I prescribe this or that drug. If, they've, if I've tried something that's a first-line drug and it didn't work out, I want to be able to go to a second-line drug without having to ask somebody permission who has no idea about caring for patients. So Isn't that the way medicine used to be practiced? It used to be practiced, yes. Yeah. Up, up until a few years ago, that's uh -huh. generally how it was. But. Yeah. Within, I think it started changing around 2009. It really started going downhill, and since then, this, the burdens have been become much, much worse. Well, I'm kind of old school, but I remember when a doctor's order was a doctor's order. Period. Period. We that know was it. it you we know, know and now, it's like, now it's a request. Yeah. A, where we get, I feel like you get a beg sometime to, and 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 the answer is, is sometimes still no. Well, this level of interference means that insurance companies and pharmacy benefit managers and imaging consultants or whatever are now practicing medicine. They are actively interfering in doctor-patient decisions. That's right, and there is some legislation addressing that, but we're not we're not going to get into that deeply. What I would like to do before, because I know you and your committee have come onto some innovative approaches to this, but before we jump into that, uh, perhaps could you outline some of these uh, these newer pilots that are going on, some of which. Uh, I'm quite concerned about, as are you, in what you were just talking about, Dr. Kimball, uh, the decapitation models, where they pay a doctor a certain amount, and if the patient gets sick, uh, it, uh, the, they have to pay for the care, the doctor has to pay for the care out of their pocket, which, which in my, from my uh, standpoint and what I know about healthcare, will create a disincentive to do what we were trained to do. Which is if you, particularly if you have a complicated patient that doesn't get better after the first thing you try, or uh, that that we were trained to pass that patient up to a subspecialist to order maybe a, a more advanced test that may be expensive. Uh, but the new scen scenarios, uh, what are con concerning me about them, 
is that it's creating an, a negative incentive to do that and to, to perform and treat the patient as we have been trained to do, uh, which is uh, really a fundamental sea shift. And I'm, I'm quite concerned about that. Uh, Dr. Flanders, you, you said you had a deja, deja vu the other day about what was going on with capitation. Maybe you can tell <laughs> us about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, one, one of the advantages of getting old is that you've seen all these things before. <coughs> and this reminds me of, of when I was starting my career, late 80s, early 90s, um, the HMOs were gaining some, some strength in the market. And the Institute essentially was a capitation system. And, it was very much like this, that we were paid so much per patient uh, per month to cover them. And, and the problem with that is that you can't control, as a physician, can't control the risk of the patients that come in. So what would happen is we have a patient that we may have been seeing for years, now all of a sudden develops diabetes or develops uh, heart issues that, that require more intensive level of care, more frequent level of care, and now that, that you know, whatever it is per month is not sufficient to cover the cost of taking care of that patient. Um, similarly, with testing that needs to be done, the, the tests that cost more, now um, they come out of what you what you get. And, and but you you practice actually practice in that environment, and you were, you told you were yeah. telling me a story about about this sheet of paper you got every at the end of every month, and yeah. and they, they were trying to ding you for ordering. Yeah, too many tests on the patient. Yeah, and monthly we would get together for a staff meeting and, they'd, and they would hand out this spreadsheet that had all the physicians listed, not by name, but our, by our, our secret physician number that everybody knew. You could figure out who was who on there and how many drugs were ordered off formulary, how many referrals were made outside the, the physician network, how many, in, in this time it was CT scans were ordered, those were the high ones. And there was no MRI yeah, at that no time MRI yet. MRI yeah. at that time, and and it it had the totals for those for each physician. Then it had the totals for the entire group. And we we had the the group that I worked with had the the exclusive contract with Prudential, who provided healthcare at that time. I don't believe they any, they do any longer, but um, and that money worked against our the bonus we would get at the end of the year. If we came underneath what had been budgeted for us, that was bonus money. And so really, we, by spending money outside of, uh, outside of the network, as it were, we were literally spending our own money. So the only way to save money is not to provide care. That just doesn't make any sense, considering how extensively yeah. doctors have been trained to, to intervene with complicated problems. Yeah. What, hap what happened to that system so back then? So with time we realized okay. that HMO the physicians, model, yeah, the physicians realized it, the patients realized it, and, and there were a couple of big lawsuits that were filed. A woman who um, was denied uh, bone marrow transplant for breast cancer, um, some, some others, and uh, it, it, it lost the attractiveness that it had first with the patients and, and with the doctors. Doctors were stopping their participation with the HMOs and, and patients stopped um, subscribing to the HMOs through their uh, employers. And you know, some of them, should, I mean, some of them did persist. We've got Kaiser Permanente that a lot of people go to and are real happy with the with the level of care. But I think that was that they were successful because of the lessons learned that came out of that. So. You know, I think what we need to do is we need to look at this time and what's different now. What are we going to do different than than what we did 25 years ago? I mean, that's my next uh, obvious question. So, what's what's what what is different between what's going on right now and back then, and why is this something? Is this going to eventually just crash on the rocks because it just doesn't make sense, or is this uh, is this uh, the current capitation system set up any different? that we need to be more concerned, uh, more or less concerned. Dr. Green, any insight on that? Well, some things change and some things stay the same, apparently, from what I'm hearing from colleagues and what I'm experiencing. Right now, we're talking about a program that's being rolled out called Payment Transformation, which is nice words for pretty much a description of a global payment model or a capitated model or a modified capitated model. But the description is uh, primary care doctors are the first uh, guinea pigs into the program, they will be paid a amount monthly based on what they were earning before. And it sounds quite um, simple, 
really not been that simple rolling out, frankly, because all of the docs I've worked with, I've worked with, um, we have 47 physicians in my group that are working on the pilot. It's been a lot of contentious conversations about getting the numbers right and so on. Just at the entry level, before discussing some of these major philosophical challenges. These are primary care docs mostly? These, or are, these are all primary all care docs in this case. Are. They intend to roll this out in some form to specialists in the coming years. Now, let me, I'll speak kind of off the cuff here. Some of the potential benefits would be if, if it met some of the criteria that like Stephen mentioned about simplification, if it could do that, that could be a plus. If the doctors then just had their monthly amount of money and were delivering care that made sense and, and doing it in a good way, it seems to suggest that would be good. However, what Chris brings up is problematic. One of the pieces of the money is called total cost of care, a different name for bonus. Uh, I'm fairly convinced right now that we're not going to affect total cost of care positively because number one, the systems are not set up nicely and integrated well and the tech is not all there so that people are still even now in 2016 having a hard time seeing where the data is and not getting it real time and it's very challenging. Two, that stuff's very expensive. You all have, have all these extra consultants and tech specialists and the computer systems themselves are very expensive. So that's a whole added new challenge and new cost. Uh, and finally, we still don't have a system where all patients come and they decide to be responsible and get their primary care and participate in the relationship to avoid chronic disease and so on. So the screening requirements that are built into these systems and so forth, uh, the preventive side of it right. is what you're talking about. So, and so in a totally idealized, and we don't live in an idealized system, in kind of a utopia, a healthcare utopia, you could see things working nicely if people didn't if they were not driven by cost, if we weren't burdened by complexities or middlemen, if we were only focused on good health care and we were allowed to collaborate as we learned as physicians, all four of us, maybe it could work. But the reality of it is it brings up these other questions, which are if I'm starting to be driven by a desire to lower costs, I think that's a fundamentally wrong-minded approach especially as a group of primary care providers, which has been described only absorb maybe, well in Hawaii, it's only 10% of the overall cost goes to primary care. To all healthcare physician providers, the number's you know, closer like to that 18 or 20%. But the way I see it is, if you don't perfect the system in advance and you don't have some major benefits to whatever model you're gonna put out, in this case, payment transformation, and that when I say major benefits, I mean totally remove the administrative burden. I think some physicians might go for a program that paid them the same or paid them in a different way if you could get rid of all the administrative burden. That might be you know, appetizing or appealing to doctors. But as Stephen pointed out very eloquently, the system that's being proposed right now does not yet do that. It adds a new uh, set of rules, a new set of things to consider, and those same, what he has very clearly said, seem to be perverse incentives, which is over time to deliver less care. So, you know, I'm going to try to work on this program and see if I can't do my best to press those points that these guys are making. Decreased administrative responsibilities, let doctors be doctors, don't really focus just on saving money. Save money if we do a great job, perhaps, and there are fewer people with terrible heart attacks or terrible cancers that we missed or didn't have an opportunity to diagnose. But don't put that out in front as the driver. So what I'm hearing, and I defer to uh, gentlemen who have had more experience, uh, these guys have gone through one extra cycle in healthcare reform than I have. They experienced some of these things and it didn't work. And so I'm hoping that at least um, our professional uh, relationships with HMSA and the others, they listen to the guys that have gone through it before and say, okay, let's not make that same mistake again. Let's take that out. If we have a new model, let's actually have a new model. Let's actually find a way to let doctors be doctors and deliver the care. Let's actually focus on some of the good stuff, prevention, maybe decreasing some of the services that people just don't want or need at the end of life that are very expensive, don't improve their quality of life. Yeah, maybe let's work on those things, but don't 
put a system on us that's just got a whole new set of rules, a whole new set of responsibilities, none of which are medical. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, I guess there are diff different utopias as well. They're the the ultimate, if you want to think about uh, doctors and our heritage, uh, you know, as the second, second oldest profession, um, our Hippocratic Oath is quite utopian, you know, to always put the patient first, uh, to not only serve one master, and that is the patient. And I think some of these new scenarios might be getting in the way of that. Yet, uh, from where I'm standing, that, that, that is really where we derive a lot of our authority and power, is the public's trust in us to do that, yeah. no matter what. So there, we have, we've got some worlds colliding here. Now, let's talk about, uh, so, so here, here's the problem we're in, folks. Uh, Dr. Kimball, you, you've, you've got some new ideas about how to reimburse doctors, um, eliminate some pay, a lot of paperwork. Uh, everyone agrees we need to reduce redundancy, uh, inefficiency. I think if inefficiency could be a battle cry here. That's maybe, that, that should be able to unify everybody, all stakeholders as well, by the way. The payers, the employers, the hospitals, efficiency. But you've, you've, you've uh, hit and thought up, hit on and thought up some innovative approaches to maybe a better world here in Hawaii. What do you got? Okay. Um I, this is actually something I've been thinking about for many, many years now, of trying to figure out what would actually work. And uh, the, the idea of capitation, uh, the, you know, a simplified version of capitation, uh, I got interested in that because of the direct primary care model, which has become popular in the mainland, especially in areas where there are a lot of people who are uninsured or underinsured, where the patient pays a primary care doctor a fixed monthly fee, a subscription fee, and the primary care doctor then delivers all their primary care. And there are no billing and collections and no administrative overhead. And a doctor and a medical assistant can handle a moderately sized primary care practice with, without any billers, without any coders, without any other, any of these other administrative costs because the overhead is very low. But they're only, that subscription fee only covers the primary care doctors, what the primary care doctor can do. It doesn't cover specialist care, emergency rooms, hospitals, imaging, lab, any of the other like things. So it's only capitating them for what's in their control. That can make sense. You can capitate for somebody for something that's in their control, and they can try to do a good job. In the direct primary care model, the doctor knows the patient has probably, is probably spending all the money they can afford on health care on that subscription fee, and they try very hard to keep them out of the hospital. They'll deal with things on the phone. They'll, they'll be flexible in, in how they respond to patient needs. They'll squeeze them in when they need to because they feel, okay, you've paid me to take care of you and I'm determined to take care of you and I'm gonna try to keep you from having all these other expenses. Telephone care uh, uh, in okay. lieu of having to come in. And so what happens like if you have an insurance company like HMSA pay that primary care capitation fee? If it was just for primary care, it might be helpful. It would reduce their billing and collection costs and enable them to reduce their overhead. But when they hold them accountable for the total cost of care, then the doctor has an incentive to avoid sick people. Because if they get someone who turns out to have an expensive disease, they're on the hook for all the hospital care and the specialist care and everything else. And, and then you have a perverse system that's designed to prevent doctors from seeing sick people, which totally violates our Hippocratic oath. It also violates the rules of nature. You know, yeah. Dr. Kimball, life is a limited event. Sooner or later, people, they get older, they get old, and they have Absolutely. organ system failure, and, they, and, and nobody I know goes down, goes down without swinging either. Yeah. That's, that's fundamental to, to well, our existence and to the, the human experience. So, so the, whole pre the whole premise of being a doc, we're gonna see sick people. So, I mean, yeah, we right. will see some well people, but we're gonna see we're sick gonna people. See sick. And sooner or later, you're gonna be on the wrong side of the rail. The system should support doctors seeing sick people. That's the whole point of health insurance. So. So my idea is, let's forget capitation as a model. It's got too many perverse incentives in it, and go back to a form of fee-for-service that's been simplified so as to be as incentive-neutral as possible. Right now, fee-for-service in the U.S. is governed by the resource-based relative value scale, which was supposed to figure out how much work and training and complexity goes into each thing the doctors do and pay them accordingly. And it's become a pay for documentation system. So if you put more and more things in your note, you get a higher reimbursement for that, which again results in administrative burdens and a waste of time. Which is included, by the way, in this model because yeah. um, the way they're rolling out the payment transformation yeah. model. In this pilot model. In this pilot model. Right. They're, right. They're saying that 
uh, in order to get the higher bands, in order to justify paying docs more for more complex patients, you're going to have to do exactly what uh, Stephen just described, which is you're going to have to put in a whole lot of extra codes and documentation right. to show people are very sick. So I'm already, I'm learning as we speak too, I'm concerned about that because then docs are going to have to either hire people to do it or sit there and figure out ways to make it look that way. I've already become tied to a com to I'm in a keyboard all day. I, did, I, okay. I had an epiphany the other day. They, how do they do it? They turn me into a typist. So instead of, uh, instead of leaving in the perverse incentives of the RBRVS relative resource-based relative value scale that rewards procedures at the expense of cognitive services, let's pay doctors for their time so that you're being paid for your expertise and you then have a patient in front of you and you do, you use everything you know, all of your expertise to try to do the right thing for that patient and you get paid the same thing whether it's a procedure or cognitive services because you're getting paid by time. And I wouldn't do this exactly like the attorneys do where they get, they, they charge by the minute and they have a clock ticking on the side and they're adding up all the hours. I would pay for the procedure, the, the time associated with the procedure schedule. So let's say you're talking about taking out cataracts for an ophthalmologist, and it takes an average of 20 minutes of an uh, ophthalmologist's time to do that procedure. So they're paid for 20 minutes of their time, which is the average in the community. If you have an efficient ophthalmologist, they might be able to do four an hour instead of three, and then they'd make a little more money. Or they might be inefficient and do only two an hour, and they make a little less money. So it would reward efficiency, and it would reward working harder. But there is no incentive to do one procedure as opposed to another, because you're paid by the time associated with that procedure. Let me ask you a question, Stephen. It's, yeah. it's very interesting to me. Yeah. Um, how, how, and I'm, I think this could be good. How does that differ from um, paying people essentially salaries as as doctors. For instance, I'm an ER doc, right? Yeah. And I get paid you know, X dollars per hour or X dollars per shift, right? And I figured out in my life that I can live on what that salary is. I do that job. Now, obviously a cardiothoracic surgeon who's had a lot more training and a lot more time put in and frankly they do more intensive stuff than I do, I would expect them to get paid significantly more. Um, your time-based system sounds like a, and correct me where I'm wrong here, sounds like a way to figure out a fair salary system overall, and maybe there's some incentives, like you say, for people who do extra work. Um, why not just do that and simplify it and then say to heck with all of the coding and the litany of overheads and extra charting and all this stuff, as long as we're doing it safely and we can right. check ourselves. Well, actually, I would, I would allow two, two models. One is independent doctors would be paid fee for time. Okay. And those that are employed by hospitals or clinics or things like that would be paid salary. Yes. Uh, and you could do it either way because both are incentive neutral with regard to which procedure you're going to do. Right. Because that's the case with me right now, which is yeah. if I'm in the ER, if yeah. I see four people in an hour or I see one, I do all I can to make them well, and I get the same salary either way for that hour. There, there are two um, issues with salary. One is it requires an employer, okay. so it doesn't work so well for independent practice. Right. That's why I would use fee for time for independent practice. And the other is that there's some tendency for doctors on salary to work less hard than those that are being paid fee for service. We have a shortage of doctors. Uh, we need more volume of services. We want to incentivize productivity, yeah. and fee for time does it naturally, whereas with salary you have to have an incentive bonus for productivity. Got it. Uh, so, but it's not that hard to do, and and I would support having a, a double model with independent doctors fee for time. And well, that helps me understand uh, why. Uh, I mean, yeah. two doctors standing next yeah. to one another in the yeah. ER, you would want yeah. them, you'd expect them once again, ideally, to work hard. I mean, and, and yeah. most doctors do. I mean, there are many. Well, I've, we I were born to work hard. We wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten to be doctors. Yeah, yeah. I, wor I work in Queen, I Queen Emma Clinic on salary. That's part time, but it's a salary position. And I'll work as hard as I can to serve the needs of the patients, even though um, I don't get paid anymore for doing so because I'm a doctor. I'm trying to do my job. I have a Hippocratic Oath, all those kind of things. Right. And you love taking care of patients. Yeah. I know all of you do. Uh, real quick, because we're running out of time, physician burnout. Yes. What's going on here? I know we have a doctor shortage. It's been proven by Dr. Withy, Professor Withy at the uh, Jepson uh, School of Medicine. 
Uh, we've got uh, six, seven hundred doctors short right now for the population. It's going to be a thousand within about three or four years, and possibly even, or probably even worse, by uh, 15 or 14 years from now, it's, it's projected to be over a thousand or 1,200 doctors short for the patient. We used to be known as the as the health state. Now, are we going to become? Are we becoming where where do doctors state? Where, where do all the doctors go state? Uh, I know a lot of retired doctors are thinking about getting out early. Uh, we've got all these pressures, this change, the electronic medical record, uh, these new payment scenarios, which are, uh, of course, upsetting to a lot of physicians who, are, who have been trained on the fee-for-service model. What are we going to do, uh, Chris Flanders? Yeah, th this is something that we've been talking about for a long time. And, you know, it was, kind of, it was kind of an avalanche of change that came on suddenly with, with the Affordable Care Act primarily being the driver that, you know, first we had to deal with putting electronic health records in our offices and then we had to deal with the meaningful use that went along with that and then there was, was yeah, then there was the pay for performance and, and those kind of things and it was just, it's always one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. and. And especially in Hawaii, where we've got a predominance of solo practice, small group uh, paradigm, that um, a lot of the managerial things that go along with these projects are just are overwhelming. You know, and, and all these, of course, are on top of taking care of patients in, in the face of a physician shortage. So everybody's working as, as fast and as hard as they can, and they, keep, they feel as though they're asked, being asked for more. Uh, what can we do to make this a more doctor-friendly state? We've hit on some of these things. Maybe a new, really humane model of payment. I understand the uh, Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare, is having an impact on us here now, uh, maybe one we didn't anticipate. And uh, Dr. Kimball, you've got some ideas on how to get waivers for some of Obamacare that may not apply to us here in Hawaii and might get in the way of us trying to turn around this doctor shortage uh, could you explain those a little for us? The, the, affordab the Affordable Care Act uh, provides for thir Section 1332 waivers, which allow a state to apply for an exception from the way the Affordable Care Act was originally conceived. Uh, but there are constraints on that. It's not an unlimited open-ended thing. You have to provide at least the same level of benefits as the Affordable Care Act expected states to provide. But I, would, I was thinking we could have this fee-for-time model and put it together as a Section 30, 1332 waiver and ask the feds, let's implement this in Hawaii instead of all the pay for performance, all the capitation, all the things with all these perverse incentives and counter incentives that we've been talking about. Let's do something that would actually take the burdens off of doctors, enable them to practice medicine the way they were trained in a, in a more cost-effective way. And there's some pluses to that, too, I, as I think about this as Stephen describes it. I mean. Right now, if you ask patients, they will say, yeah, I can't find a doctor to take me because I have Medicare. A lot of people have Medicare. Uh, same thing for Medicaid. Well, if you did do a you know, model like uh, fee-for-service, uh, I'm sorry, uh, fee-for-time, fee for time, forgive me, you'd be showing very clearly that you were providing the time for those patients, those very patients that needed to find a doctor because you otherwise wouldn't be getting paid. So um, I, I support any model that simplifies the administrative universe around the doctor uh, or his or her staff. Uh, as I see these programs go, uh, just a small vignette, the time I was happiest, very happiest as a physician was when I was working um, as a volunteer doctor between med school and residency and I was doing work in a totally far away hospital even outside of the country in Africa where we had almost no technology, almost no anything, and we were seeing 80, 90, 100 patients a day and just taking care of patient after patient after patient. It was not about money. We were in our training phase of life, but we delivered an incredible amount of care. No one was breathing down our necks. People were extraordinarily grateful because we were doing quick surgical procedures. We were diagnosing illnesses that they had not had care for for many years. We were writing, writing chart notes for other doctors not to get paid for something Just or to feed an administrative. Right. Mm -hmm. There was like no administrative, right? Yeah. There was no administration yeah. at all, and we saw a ton of patients. As opposed to currently, when I'm in the ER, they added this fancy EMR, electronic medical record system, and I went from being able to see a patient in six or eight minutes for a basic thing 
to now sometimes it's 30 or 40 minutes horsing around with the electronic medical chart, getting rejected by this, that, or the other thing, whether it's the computer or someone on the other end of the computer or uh, someone prior authing or not prior authing. So even an emergency doctor that's got a run and gun is now tied to a computer, Precisely. to a document all day? And so, you so just think of those two, you know, those are two very different experiences, but one was before I was even really trained adequately to, to know all the things I know, I could see many patients and get pretty great results and all I had to do to get a better result was turn to one of these guys who had 15 years of extra experience and I'd say, hey Dr. Kemble, what do I do with this? He would say, you do this. Yeah, I took care of more patients. Afterwards. Right. Yeah. No administrative burden. We were really happy about it as opposed to the exact opposite ex experience which we're now having which is no matter what discipline we are in, whether it's cardiology, psychiatry and primary care, you know, at primary care for us or ER, it's just so burdensome and I think that contributes both to some of the economic challenges with all the extra overhead and the physician burnout. I feel burned out when I have to, instead of, I love seeing the patient for the few minutes that I always took to see them to help them with their heart problem or their... But then the administrative side of it is just uh, becoming un unbearable. I immediately yeah. become upset. All yeah. right, well I gotta wrap it up. Well listen, I w any, anyone who's watching the show, I want you to know the HMA if you're a doctor, we got your back. We're, we're, we're understanding of these problems and pressures that doctors are under, and we're going to do something about it. Uh, we are doing something about it right now. We've got a bunch of volunteers, and I want to thank all you doctors here for your volunteerism and your service. Uh, thanks for being here on Stethoscope, and stay tuned for the next episode where we'll take on this and other important topics. Thanks for joining us. Aloha.